the nice thing about Mexico is that it's a welcoming country. People open your, their arms to receive you in their houses. Like we've seen in the restaurants with the grandmothers. Like we are, you arrive there and they're just like, welcome to our house. You know? And they give you this amazing food. And everywhere you go, the culture is different. Even if, if we are the same country, like the culture from Oaxaca compared to the culture of Valle de Bravo, it's completely different, no? Like we were talking, this is a mixture between India, Peru, Colombia. It's like the food, the people, the way they dress, their, their dances. My name is Estefano Salgado. I was born in Valle de Bravo. When Nick first called me that he wanted to do a tour in Mexico about flying and cooking and going deep into like the cultural part, the first thing that came to my mind was like, we should, we should go to Oaxaca. You know, there's this meet going on at the end of November and this is the best place we can do this, these things. No? So we came to Oaxaca uh, for a number of reasons. One, uh, I've never been here and uh, you know I've heard so much about it from the art scene uh, to the, the food uh, scene, um, cooking with moles and chiles, uh, and as well the mezcal scene. You know, all of those things, this is kind of the epicenter uh, for, the, for, for Mexico and, and therefore for the world. If you don't have mole mezcal in Mexico, what do you really have? Los Pacos, we are on the search for the great mole. So this place supposedly has uh, five to six different moles. It's one of the best mole places um, in town. So let's check out what that's about. So I hope you could smell the like all the flavors and everything, all the smells. So here in, in, in this region of Mexico, they, they eat a lot of uh, insects, a lot of grasshoppers. No? Oaxaca right now, it's well, it's always been, but now like everywhere in the world, it's the, it's the mecca for Mexican cuisine. The flavors, the ingredients, the tradition. Like we've been going to restaurants that they are in the yards and the living rooms or of grandmothers. And so you like, I'm sure there were like amazing cooks and suddenly people start going there. And now their restaurant is, uh, their house is the restaurant. Yesterday we went to see this lady in the middle of a town. Like we had to drive 40 minutes to, to visit her. And it's one of the best culinary experiences I've had in my life. And at night, we, like after flight, we got all together in another house. And it's maybe the best molly I've had in my life. It's not only the food that it's good, it's also the experiences surrounding the food. Every, every house has a different recipe. There's not a recipe, like, like mole, it's not like you have to put chocolate, you have to put nuts, you have to put like, no, mole is, Whatever peppers you have around, if you have some nuts, you put some nuts. If you have chocolate, you put chocolate. Depending on the style of molly you want to cook. You know? So that's why there's really, like you can't really tell how many moles there are in, in Mexico because every house makes their own. Stefano is a master chef and he uh, owns a restaurant in um, Valle de Rabo. He's a multi-generational cook. So he studied at the Culinary Institute of America. I, I've known Nick since since many years. Like I, I think I, I knew him even before I started flying. I started flying when I was 18. Now I'm 34, so it's been a while. And Tyler, Tyler is a new discovery. All right here we are, Oaxaca. The greaser, the local crew. He's becoming part of the group now. He's gonna be part of the Valle family. My name is Tyler Brott, and I came down here to Oaxaca. Got invited down here by uh, Nick and some of the local crew down here to uh, do some paragliding. Yeah, the food, the culture, the people, it's just like incredible. It's like paragliding is the excuse and then everything else that we've been able to experience has just been phenomenal. Having Stefano, Stefano as a guide and, you know, being able to listen and, and dive into, you know, what is mezcal? How is mezcal made? Um, talking about, you know, the, the different foods and the different preparations um, is, is really, you know, kind of what I look for in a trip. Well, right, right now we're standing in, a, in an agave plantation. These are cactus, they're agaves. This var variety, it's a spadin, it's the most common 
variety in in Mexico to to make mezcal. Normally, mezcal have to you have to grow them for eight to twelve years. These ones, but wild agaves have they need to be at least twenty years old, and they cannot be produced or or grown like in, in plantations. They are wild. Here they 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 have wild agaves. When when you have a wild agave, you don't wanna you don't wanna add like different like any external flavor into the into the mezcal, but you wanna preserve the original flavor. So they're using these uh, glass bottles to to make a smoother and bolder flavor of the of the agave. No? They cut it and then they let it they let it like for a couple of years more. So they can they can reach a certain level of sugars inside the, the agave to, to produce a better mezcal. Before we saw them like when the pines arrived, and now they then they chop them and they put they put them over these ovens that they they heat stones with uh, with wood. So after after the these maguey's are cooked, they chop them in little pieces with a knife and they bring them here. They cover like halfway of the of the pit. They cover it. And they're using these animals, these, uh, they have horses, donkeys, to, to move this wheel. This, this wheel is uh, it's like 1,600 pounds, almost a ton. Mezcal has been there forever, but the mezcal boom has like started 15 years ago. And now around the world, you're gonna start seeing more and more and more because mezcal is like wine. It depends on the producer, depends on the soil, depends on the type of agave, depends on the terrar, like it, it, all, it all influences in the final product. My name is Alejandro Murrieta. I'm called Bibis. I'm here in Oaxaca by a really nice invitation from Tete, which we call Stefano. And it was all about a paragliding trip um, that consisted on a mixture of flying, good friends, the best food, and some cultural immersion. I think it's super special in Oaxaca, that feeling of authentic uh, Mexican essence, where people still have um, beliefs on mystical things. Remembering myself that I'm a Mexican and that I am part of all that, um, it's super eh, special. Flying in a gaggle of friends or a group of paragliders, how we call um, gaggle, is like the closest form of magic or the most tangible form of magic I can uh, or I have ever experienced. You've got a complete um, commitment to trusting yourself, uh, mother nature and what's there around that you cannot see and you've got friends to to trust on and to do teamwork with because it's all about uh, visual reference so your friends are your your birds the birds sorry and your friends are the trees and the smokes and in a deeper sense all the people that you expose yourself to dead life the simplest situations and the most rewarding times Alright, day two on launch. It's like an epic day today. Better than yesterday. It's good friends. <laughs> We're gonna send it. It's 
The Mexican paragliding community has been going on for 30 something years. Obviously, like everywhere in the world, there are some spots like Valle de Bravo that are more developed, but there's these kind of places where still paragliding is like a secret, no? People don't know it very well. You don't have infrastructure like other places, but uh, it's growing. We are around 450 active pilots around the country. Straight over here, check this out. Pyramids. Yeah, look at this. Look at this soaring up these pyramids. Yes. Whoa, look at those vultures. Paragliding in, in Mexico is really unique. You're flying along, you're seeing these little towns like up on the hillside or out in the flats, and all these towns have this central plaza and just so so much character. There's a big church, it's amazing, and being able to see it from the air is sort of, you know, you're sort of guessing what might be down there in the town on the ground. And, it was a blast, like I didn't know what to expect, but first I got to meet a group of super good sportsmen that all of a sudden are willing to share a lot of experience and good times. And flying with, with a group like that, it's super nurturing, like doesn't matter what level you're flying at, you're always able to share up and down the ladder with everybody. Seeing uh, sportsmen from other disciplines come paragliding and, and getting a feel of what it is to be fully exposed in the air. It's super special because you see how um, they've got some certain sense of adventure and they just uh, polarize that knowledge to some other element. Incredible, we've been really, really lucky. Couldn't be with anybody better and I think my big takeaway from this trip is going to be the people that we got to connect with and share this experience with. For me, that's been the, uh, the most um, meaningful, amazing thing about this trip. Getting to see the ground from a macro perspective, so from a bird-like view, and then getting back onto the ground later at night with your friends and getting on a micro perspective and going street to street, you know, taco to taco, uh, is, is what I live for. Amigos, si, sí, estaba bien, estaba bien. Ahora vuelo bien cuando está terminado seguro. ¿Cuántos hoy o en mi vida? Ah, de nosotros, como 30, 30 pilotos. <laughs> 